Everyone, hopefully, uh, there we are. Good evening. Uh, my name is Robin Ince. I'm going to be hosting this evening. We are going to be talking about this book, which you uh, all know about. Also, hello to those who are watching at home via streaming. And uh, there is a huge amount to get through, um, in particular, an excellent recipe for aubergine parmigiana. So, I hope we have time for that. So, please welcome to this stage. Tim Spector and Stephen Bartlett. Oh, you took a risk with the wires there. Can't you see me? Hello. Hello, Stephen. I'm, I want to start off straight away, uh, Tim, with before we get into the science of this, uh, I was hearing today that you have been doing things with pasta that have set social media alight. Can you tell me what's been going on? Uh, yeah, um, hello everyone. Um, I've been stripping kale. And uh, apparently this has uh, driven social media into a frenzy, uh, my kale stripping. And uh, basically mixing it with cannellini beans and putting it into pasta. And so um, that, that little clip has, has gone uh, quite viral, uh, getting people very excited about um, having kale pasta. And I think it's quite nice because generally pasta is not seen as a sort of healthy dish, but again, by mixing it with, with things you can, uh, you know, still have your cake and eat it. Well, this is the reason I wanted you all to know before the rest of the world knows is there is going to be a kale rush. So if you think the speed that toilet paper disappeared at COVID is in, no, kale rush is going to be bigger than that, I think. And I will be demonstrating my kale stripping later if anyone wants to. Um, now, am, I the only one that's, am I the only one that's really confused? What's kale stripping? <laughs> oh, right. I, has anyone here got any kale so we can have this demonstrated? How do you strip kale? And why would one want to strip kale? Oh, you t oh well, Tim, t tell, tell them about kale stripping. Got stuck on kale a bit, but um, maybe they turn it's a good off. subject. So, you want to to cook it evenly. You see, you, you need to separate the leaves and the thick stalk. Otherwise, you'll end up with gooey leaves and and, and really uncooked stalk. So that's the, the first thing. So this, it's a nice little trick. You just get a handful of it and you pull it down really hard. So you've ended up with a stalk in one hand and all the leaves in the other. And it's a little party trick. Okay. Um, that's it. Then you've got to cook them separately. When you do, the leaves actually work really well uh, and are quite tasty, but even better when you mix them with beans, and that's what, that's what we've done. But kale is super healthy, but has a bad reputation as being too healthy, therefore not very pleasant to eat. Okay. So we're trying to change yeah. that. So right, yeah. uh, I'll, we'll, we'll have a, a private kale uh, tasting session later. The, uh, it's got seedy so early. Um, Stephen, are you someone who, uh, do you cook a lot? No comment. Right, okay, so no. Um, no I, do. I do, but it's very simple. I actually, when I was younger, my mum had a restaurant, so I was, I was the salad chef, essentially, in the back room. We were all, my three siblings, we all had to play a role in the restaurant, and I was the youngest, so I did the simple stuff, which was salads. Um, but because of the nature of my life these days and my schedule, I don't, I don't cook a lot, no. Well, we will get onto that because I think that's one of the difficulties sometimes in trying to balance a work life and actually eating healthily. But I, I want to get, just go back, Tim, to really where a lot of these ideas come from, which is, you know, this idea of, well, ultimately, gut bacteria and, 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 the, and the biome. And, and this seems to, this is really only about 10 years old, isn't it? Our understanding, which has entirely changed, our understanding of what a good diet should be. I think so, yes. Uh, it, this new way of thinking about what a good diet should be rather than the old-fashioned way of thinking about calories and fats and a few of these macronutrients because we didn't understand there was this whole other organ in our bodies, this whole complexity of the gut microbes. Um, it was, it's actually probably about 20 years old but has only come into common understanding really in the last 10 and we've seen even in the last five years big changes in what we see in the shops now um, you see it you know in london suddenly you can get kefir kombucha kimchi you know in places you wouldn't have dreamt of 10 years ago so i think we are seeing this this food revolution that is 
mirroring our understanding of the gut microbiome. And all foods really, uh, uh, you know, have a, in a way, you can look at them differently if you're looking at it from the, the perspective of if you are a gut microbe. Um, and I think we all need to put ourselves in, in the place of a gut microbe these days to, in order to fully appreciate food and say, you know, we're there waiting for the good stuff to come to us. And, you know, with all this junk food around, many of our microbes have, you know, been very lonely. So what is, what is going on in terms of the digestive process? What is going on with that gut bacteria? What is going on, and equally also, what is not going on if someone has just gone and had fast food, had a burger, had some ultra-processed food? What is the difference between what is going on inside them and someone who's had some kombucha and kale? Okay, well, you're, you're, so we're full of these gut, we've got trillions of these microbes inside us. They live a, a fast and loose life. So in between 30, every 30 or 60 minutes, they, they're born, they find, you know, they have sex and they have babies and uh, they die. So they've got, to, they've got to take life as, you know, quickly and, and when they get food, they want, that's when they're energized and they, so they're waiting around. Some of them are waiting in spore form for years, but when, when the action is there, they're really going for it. Now, when they get real food like kale, they will break it down, get the nutrients, and then produce chemicals that are really important for the rest of the body, particularly our immune system, helping us fight everything from aging, cancer, um, COVID, uh, autoimmune disease, food allergies, everything else. They, important for our brain, fighting mental health, sending out chemicals to our brain to uh, stop us getting depression, anxiety, and a whole range of other problems. And this, these are really key to our well-being. Now, if they don't, not getting fed, so they get, they get a, a KFC or something else, um, they're waiting there, and they're waiting for that, that food to come to them. It never gets there, because it's all absorbed. Um, might be a little bit of chicken that gets there, but that's, that's not really much for them to eat. So they're essentially being starved of the plant life they need and the fiber to produce all these good chemicals. And at the same time, they're getting a rain of other chemicals on them, all these artificial sweeteners, these um, glues like emulsifiers, these preservatives, the chemicals that they are not used to seeing in nature because a lot of them come from the petroleum industry. And th that is making them produce really odd signals. So they're trying to break it down. It's like when they see artificial sweeteners, they say, well, I'm trying to break this down into something uh, that I can recognize. And they mess up and they cause all kinds of inflammatory signals to the body. And that goes into the immune system, that goes to the brain. And that's why we think uh, junk food diets cause depression, anxiety, immune problems, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it, it's a complex mechanism, but you can clearly see the difference um, to our poor our microbes depending on your food choice. That's why our food choices are the most important ones we can make every day for our health. The artificial sweetener one I think is particularly interesting because again it seems quite recent that people have found out actually if you are choosing sometimes between the diet alternative and what used to be called the full fat alternative you're much better having the one which is less processed out of the two. Yes, whereas actually you're swapping you know, fairly natural sugar for a completely unnatural uh, petrochemical um, uh, compound that might give you less tooth decay, but may be causing many other problems as well. So um, I'm not to say that's necessarily better or worse, but neither are particularly good for you. And so the idea that just because we replace one thing with a reformulation in industry isn't, isn't good. And that's, that's been our mistakes we've been making for the last 40 years constantly reformulating everything, keeping the food companies getting more and more profit whilst our health has been suffering. And the UK is, is the sickest place in Europe with the most ultra-processed food in Europe. And it's definitely not getting better. Stephen, what, uh, in terms of the way that you think about your diet, have, do, you know, when you're in your, it's not that long ago for you, when you're in your early 20s, you know, what would be, a typical kind of day's eating for you? 
really, um, in my early 20s, I was very, very stressed. I was running a, a business that was growing very quickly. We had lots of employees. I was younger or the same age as most of my employees. We had cash flow issues pretty much every month. So you get to the end of the month, you can't pay your team. Um, you have to find a way within a couple of hours to pay the team. So food and diet and my health and all those things were such so low on my list of priorities that I ate whatever I, whatever I could eat. Um, and it typically meant, typically in a day, I would not eat until about 7 p.m., which is typically when I'd have my first meal, because I got, I'm just very busy with work that I don't almost forget the signal to listen to the signal of hunger. Um, my diet was very bad. It was very inconsistent. I was very inconsistent with the gym. I thought sleep was a waste of time. Um, and I was your typical, typical kind of hustlepreneur who was, as I, as I came to learn, making a fundamental miscalculation about what the furthest thing upstream was that was causing a lot of the symptoms I was seeing in my life. And I, th I think about this all, of, all the time. I think about it in the context of business, but I was thinking about it as Tim was explaining. Tim there said that food is the most important thing. And, as I, and I agree, and so my question then becomes, what are the things that are gonna influence my food decisions? Hmm because it's all like well and good, hoping my like willpower or my discipline or my motivation will cause me to reach for the fucking kale, sorry to swear, um, will reach for the kale. But on that day when I've landed into LA and it's 2 a.m. and I haven't eaten on the plane and all my hormones are messed up because of the traveling and my circadian rhythms off, what I actually do when I land and I feel that pain in my stomach and I'm, you know, my cortisol levels are up is, is is not necessarily what I'd post on my Instagram stories. Mm. Like what, what, me, what happens in that gas station at 2 a.m. in like a 7-Eleven is not something that Zoe would be proud of. So yeah, you, you, you go in yeah. and you say, have you got any kale? And they say, no, but we've got exactly. these Twinkies. And you go, well, Twinkies are like yeah. kale, aren't Honestly, they? So I'll have those. The more I've learned about health, it's just, it's staggering. If you pull over in LA or in America and you go into a gas station, and you try and buy something healthy. Impossible. Genuinely. And so when I do these podcasts and people talk to me about the food system and the food industry and about willpower and motivation, I go like, but we're, the food environment is so unbelievably toxic at the moment that I, I don't blame people for making bad decisions because it's very, very difficult in high friction to make good ones. And this is, this is like the first thing that needs to change. I was, I was actually quite compelled and encouraged by the fact that RFK in America, although he doesn't like Trump, has joined forces with Trump on the sole basis that he allows him to reform, reform the US food system. It is, it is unbelievable. We actually have it slightly better here. And I'm sure if you've been to the US, you'll uh, sort of resonate with the idea that you come back two stone more in weight even if you try hard. And my team flies out there all the time to LA and New York. We've just come back from New York. And I always struggle. I always struggle to eat healthily. I always put on weight. I always feel like crap, even when we're trying to eat well, even when we're buying salads every day. And it's, it's just because, I mean, you can speak to this. You know what's going on more than I do. Well, what are they adding to the salads? What are they adding to the sauces? You know, it's like, they want you to eat more of them. The bloody salad doesn't go off. No. And I know this because yeah. I, I left it on the side in my hotel and it didn't go off for a week. <laughs> I thought this can't be healthy. Mm. Isn't that funny that again, that's one of the things which in one way, that's the future image, isn't it? Which ultimately becomes Soylent Green. But you know where, oh, isn't it great? This tomato hasn't gone off. And then you go, oh no, yeah. this is a really kind of, you know, again, our understanding, it seems to us, it seems to me anyway, that in some ways we had a food revolution that looked like it was improving things but really it was kind of improving things for the companies, but not improving things for us and, and our eating habits. Well, that, that's right. I mean, in the 1970s, food companies were small little uh, groups of small to medium scale companies, and they have become as big as uh, most countries in the world in terms of their budget. So, you know, 10 global companies control about 70% of the food. Uh, you know, it's unheard of. They have billions at their disposal because they've basically been able to take more and more of the food that was produced manually and create it in factories, cut costs using extracts of food, gluing it together, making it look like real food at better and better margins. 
and selling it to us, you know, with salads that can last uh, a week or two, and, you know, that cost virtually nothing to make. So this is, this is where we are, and they have such power, they're controlling politicians, particularly in the US and the UK, to make sure that there's no rules to even the playing field and let people who produce real food compete in that, in that market. And that, that's the real danger here. And as I said, the food environment is, it's really hard. So, you know, people come at me and they say, How can, it's all very well for you live in North London in this, you know, rich place. You can go around, you've got all these trendy places to eat. You know, you go anywhere in the UK, and I've been on a tour to Leeds and Liverpool, and you go anywhere on, on British rail, national rail, you can't get anything, like you're saying. That's like, you know, a gas station in, uh, in LA. People, and if you're in a poor area, you know, you are, it's impossible to, to eat well. Uh, and I think this is where we're, we're facing these problems, because uh, we have a choice here, but many people just, just don't. And when you go into a different environment, as Stephen says, you notice it. Did you, I, um, I mean, would you like to see legislation coming in? Would you like to see actually, you know, because it does feel that without something like that, it's very, very hard to shift habits, unless you have a really full-on kind of process and way to progress that. And I know that sounds very, you know, against kind of libertarian ideas, whatever you might say, but it does feel like, as you said, with, if we are the sickest country in Europe. Well, I mean, the people here probably it don't need legislation, but because they're educated enough to, to understand that they can make those food choices, they're probably living in places where you've got those choices, but maybe their kids aren't, maybe their grandchildren aren't, uh, you know, they're having school dinners that are a, a disgrace, and they cost two, you know, make processed foods for two pounds a, a day or whatever it is. I tell you, look, 2 a.m. in LA, me and that gas station, I need some legislation. Because even if you're rich, you can't, it, it, there's nothing else you can do. It, do you know how hard it is to find healthy food in an airport? Mm. Or if you're on a train? Or, you know, and it's, it's interesting that all the food in transit, when people are poorly slept and probably highly stressed, tends to be the most processed and the, the, the food that's typically worse for you. I, I, it's interesting because I reflect on what Jamie Oliver did for, for schools and the impact that that, I think, was a net positive on schools, especially growing up. I was annoyed at the time because I was, I was in secondary school when that happened and our vending machine went from Mars bars to apples. But it shows, no, it was, we all remember how annoying that was to be on the receiving end of it. But in hindsight, I go, that was really, really smart because a lot of young people develop their food habits in that window and those food habits will stay with them for life. Thanks.